So hello, everyone. Thanks for showing up for the last presentation of the day. Uh, my name is Jula Fora, and I work as a developer in the streaming platform team at King. Today, I'm going to talk about a bunch of different things around building streaming applications, running them in large scale production environments. Uh, I hope every one of you will find something interesting in my slides, uh, but we'll see. So some background about the company. Uh, King is uh, a gaming company. We create mobile games. Uh, it's actually one of the, the biggest uh, mobile gaming companies in the world, uh, now part of the Activision Blizzard family. Uh, some of our most popular games you probably know, such as Candy Crush. Uh, they're actually so popular that there are hundreds of millions of people playing the games all over the world. And they, these games generate about 40 billion events every single day, which translates uh, into a lot of data for us on the backend side. So what does this mean for us from a data analytics perspective, more, more importantly from a stream processing perspective? If I can switch my slides. What? All right. So on the left-hand side, we have the game client, uh, somebody playing Candy Crush on their mobile phones on, or their tablets or on Facebook. And as they play the games, uh, these games generate a bunch of events for, for different things that happen inside the game when you start up your game client or when you start, uh, start a new game round in Candy Crush, you make a purchase or more uh, if we're lucky. And then you finish your level, maybe close the application. Uh, all these different actions that you take in the game generate events that are uh, buffered for some very short time on the client and then are uh, transferred to the game servers, which will ultimately ride them to Apache Kafka. So this is where the streaming part begins for us. We don't really care about what happens on the client. We work with the data that comes from Kafka to, to make the whole thing a little bit easier. So we have these 40 billion events uh, every day coming from Kafka. And if we want to write some analytics application that will look at, like, OK, how did we do on this certain game feature? Is the revenue going nicely? Do we have more crashes after this new release? We have to write some analytics application, uh, maybe some Kafka consumers or some Flink streaming job. If, if it's a more com sophisticated logic inside it, you probably want to accumulate some state. You probably already heard a lot about state management. Uh, the interesting uh, thing here for us is that with hundreds of millions of, uh, of people, if you start keeping state for, for every user, this is going to grow into, uh, into the terabyte scale very easily, even if you uh, only keep very small or very simple states. And at the end of the day, what we want to get out of this thing is something that is useful for data scientists and engineers who work for the company, who are trying to make the game be games better, or even, even some real-time game feature uh, at the end. So let's look at the different uh, types of streaming applications that we have now at King. So we can roughly categorize them into four different sets of applications. Obviously, we have uh, some simple Kafka consumer logic uh, going on all over the place. These are mostly uh, very simple application logic. You're all familiar with Kafka, probably. I don't want to go into the details. Another important set of applications are real-time dashboards, where uh, if you're a data scientist, you can look at like how is my game doing? Is the revenue stream going nicely uh, like, during the day? And we have a bunch of these dashboards for all the different games that we have. Uh, they're actually po powered by uh, simple Kafka uh, consumer type applications uh, in this category. I will, I will also talk about the ones that are powered by Flink later. The third class of applications uh, are the ones that are built either as standard Flink programs maybe are using some of our uh, in-house build libraries to make it, uh, make it easier for some King-specific tasks, or written in our own uh, data pipeline language called King Streaming SDK. This is a thin wrapper on top of uh, Flink's data stream API, which uh, makes some King-specific uh, transformations very simple to do. 
So, so people who are new to Flink and stream processing, they don't have to learn the whole Flink stack to, to get their applications up and running. They can just focus on uh, the kink-specific semantics, and we have some nice deployment procedures for them to deploy their, their applications on top of Yarn. So the last and I would say most important thing uh, for this presentation is our real-time analytics platform. Uh, so what is this platform? It's called Arbea, which is short for rule-based event aggregator. It's probably a stupid name, but we can't change it because it's been there for a while. So the platform itself is powered by Apache Flink, and it provides uh, developers and data scientists a way to write nice and expressive scripts that they can deploy against the live production data streams. Uh, so these scripts uh, are actually fairly sophisticated mini streaming programs. Uh, in Flink terminology, you can think of um, people being able to deploy process functions as, as their scripts. So these scripts can uh, access state, create timers, work on sessions. Actually, a bunch of different functionality that, are, uh, uh, that you can't even do inside a, a regular Flink operator. For instance, you can increment window aggregates. It's not a pipeline language. It's more like an imperative way of writing event triggers. So for instance, let's say you want to count game ends. Then you will add a script that, uh, which for every game end will get a window aggregator with one minute time buckets and incremented aggregator. This is the script that you would write. And you could deploy it in our platform. And then you would uh, have it up and running. It also supports complex stateful computations. And of course, it's running on top of Apache Flink. And so it provides all the nice guarantees that we get from the system out of the box. So it's, and it's also scalable. All right, so this is a nice thing in, in general. So why is this uh, interesting for you? Uh, well, this is actually something that is, has been running uh, in a fairly stable way since, like, for, more, for over a year now. Uh, and it's running for more than 20 live games. At the moment, we have different environments. And there are actually more than like, 200 live streaming applications running in the form of these small scripts. Uh, and they have accumulated more than 5 terabytes of user state. Yeah. All right. So in the next part of the presentation, I will actually go into detail on how to build a platform like this and uh, what's the secret sauce behind Arbea. So basically, the most distinguishing feature of this platform is that it's not just a way of creating new fling jobs from scripts. In our case, we actually have the platform, the, the platform backend running as a single Flink job, which will take the deployment of these new scripts. And all the new scripts will be actually running inside one statically deployed uh, Flink job. So to look at the, the whole architecture from a bird's eye view, uh, on, the, on the bottom left hand corner, we have the events coming in. And they're consumed by the, the backend streaming job. This, stream, this streaming job, I will go into more detail later, will consume each event only once. And we'll kind of multiplex uh, this event across all the scripts that are deployed at the moment for this specific game. So how do we get uh, new scripts, our base scripts deployed in our, in our job? We have a REST API which takes deployment information and will push it and will push it to Kafka. So the backend will actually get the script deployment information. You want to deploy a new script or remove an already running script from Kafka and modify the running uh, fling job dynamically, do some code generation to make this nice, and then start executing your logic uh, next to the, all the previous ones that have been already running. Once your script starts to produce some output, the backend will realize this and kind of collect some uh, job information about the runtime of the scripts and will route this back through the REST API to the front end so people can click on the aggregators that they produce and they will get a shiny dashboard uh, immediately. So, how does the backend work? 
So this is the, the core processing logic uh, in Arbea. So at the heart of this Flink topology, there is uh, there's a Flink operator that receives two different types of uh, input. It's implemented as a low-level Flink operator. It, it's not a process function or any uh, high-level operator. Uh, this Flink operator receives two input streams. Uh, first of all, it receives, and it receives the partitioned event stream we partition by the user ID of the events. And it also receives the broad a broadcasted stream of control messages that contain new script deployments, removals, updates to currently deployed scripts. So what happens inside this operator is that every new uh, control message uh, adds, if you deploy a new script, we store the, that as a broadcast state inside the operator. And for every new event, we loop over all the scripts that are currently deployed and execute their application logic. So this way, we're kind of dynamically configuring this, uh, this stream operator as new deployments are coming. Uh, and in order to provide the functionality uh, that we have in the API, for instance, uh, to give you an example about window aggregates, so if you, have a, if you have a simple script that will, for every game start, increment an aggregator, what will happen in the backend side is when you call aggregator increment, we will actually create an output message uh, from this operator, which is an aggregator increment output control message, which is routed to a dedicated window operator, which will dynamically assign it to a window uh, grouped by the current script and current, uh, uh, current aggregator name and current time window, and will do the proper window aggregation using the Flink uh, built-in windowing mechanisms. And once we have the output results, uh, they're sent to Kafka or whatever database to produce the dashboards and send this information back to the user. Under the script, uh, we have a fairly wide stack of functionality built in that uh, are exposed through the APIs. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, these scripts can access state. And in this architecture, the state they can accumulate and access is actually shared across all the scripts. So this is a very nice way to, to deploy multiple scripts that can manipulate or access the same state. So for instance, maybe you have a script that accumulates some fancy user state that is, uh, is actually useful for many different processing logic. In this architecture, uh, all the subsequent scripts can just uh, read the state that another script accumulated without having to double down on the, on the state size and also the processing power. On top of the state, uh, we of course have uh, timers, some metadata services, and uh, a fairly nice caching layer uh, where, we store the, where we store the states. Um, one thing to note here is that we use our custom serialization stack uh, which is, of course, uses Flink serializers to some extent, uh, together with our caching mechanism uh, to, to get the most out of uh, the ROGSDB backends. All right. So now let's, let's zoom in some of the aspects of building this, uh, building this application. So first of all, we had a, a pretty uh, long evolution of the, the state backends in the last two years or so when we were actually using this platform already. So obviously, everybody starts out with something like the file state backend, which keeps the key, uh, keys on the heap. Yeah, but that, that quickly becomes a problem. You start to have these like JVMs with huge heap sizes. You, you get into trouble with garbage collection. So uh, we had to ditch that first. But back then, we didn't really have a nice alternative, uh, such as RocksDB, to replace it with. So uh, we first implemented another state backend, which started storing the, the states in a remote database. In our case, it was a sharded MySQL uh, cluster. Uh, and on top of that, we had a caching layer inside Flink, so we don't have to write to the database all the time and don't have to, to get it uh, all the time. In, in, our, in our case, the access pattern is pretty straightforward. If you get uh, events for a, for a single user, you will probably get some more. So there is pretty good uh, cache hit rate if you have like a, a sensible sized cache. Yeah. Unfortunately, this this only worked until a certain state size. 
It doesn't. It provides a very poor read performance, as you might imagine, reading from an external database. Write performance is not a problem. Also, checkpoint times are pretty good because you pretty much don't have to do anything because they're also already in the database. So with some clever uh, checkpointing algorithm, you kind of get uh, incremental checkpointing for free. Uh, well, recovery itself is pretty much instant, but then you, <laughs> but then the read performance bites you. So at one point, when the RocksDB uh, backend became available, we immediately switched to that. So with the RocksDB backend, we still kept our cache layer. Uh, it's, it was still a huge performance improvement on top of the vanilla RocksDB state backend. Now we got rid of a, a bunch of these problems, uh, mostly regarding to read and write performance. Uh, but the recovery speed was not that good, especially if we started uh, as the state size started to become uh, larger and larger with terabytes of state, copying it back. It really hurt our network and also uh, the jobs itself. So finally, uh, thanks to the data artisans guys, we got the incremental RocksDB checkpoints, which seem to solve almost all the problems uh, except for the recovery speed. But they're working on this, so I'm pretty sure uh, we're going to find new problems later. Yeah. I have one slide about the incremental checkpointing, though, because it's, I think it's a very nice improvement. So on these two graphs, you can see the, the disk I.O. and network traffic on our computing cluster over uh, a, few, a few days. So you can see that uh, if, you, if you look at the left-hand side, I mean, it was pretty constantly high. We have like 40, 50 jobs running. And, I mean, the checkpointing intervals weren't synced, so they were writing checkpoints all the time to, to HDFS. So the first time we, we migrated to incremental checkpoints, there was a huge drop in the network traffic, which is kind of expected by the incremental snapshots. But we didn't really think that it was going to be this huge. And once we migrated all of our jobs, uh, it's like a 4x improvement or uh, reduction in the network traffic. So it really uh, helped our clusters be more stable over time. All right. So next interesting aspect of building a platform like this is how do you work with, uh, oops, there are some lagging problems with this. Oh, no, that was actually good. Yeah. So some of the problems with uh, building the streaming platform like this is what do you do with the dashboards and the real-time aggregates that you want to give to people? So you have a bunch of these like time windows uh, and yeah, you need some kind of some sort of a component which will expose this to the users. Uh, hopefully, put it in s some sort of a database where they can query it, and some easy and nice way to to make a dashboard out of it. So, what people would do in general is that they add uh, after your af after their window operations, they add a Flink sync that will uh, create some sort of like a database connection and just insert it as new events come. Well, this is uh, surprisingly tricky to get right in a production uh, setting. So there are a bunch of different problems that will inevitably come. Uh, uh, you will have connection issues to the database. It's going to become unavailable. I'm, it's pretty sure it's going to have throughput problems at certain points in time. Then you have to do some clever batching on the inserts. You will end up with all this duplicated logic in all your streaming applications, and you you fix problems, and they like still remain in some versions, and yeah, you're not even sure which one is going to break the next time. And there are a whole bunch of sneaky bugs that you will run into if if you do this, uh, especially if you run it for for some period of time. So what we ended up doing is we came up with a system called Aggregato. It's actually pronounced Arigato. The the G's are silent where we have a dedicated event format for, for writing uh, window aggregate data. So the streaming jobs will actually just push it to a dedicated topic that is reserved for this uh, aggregato application. Uh, the events will contain a timestamp, some information about the time bucket, the name identifier for the aggregator table, uh, the dimension data, so kind of like the group by information. So maybe I'm. Uh, 
um, aggregating revenue per level, then the dimension would be the current level. It's whatever JSON that uh, you can come up with, I guess. And the actual aggregated value. So what Aggregato does is a simple Kafka consumer application at the moment, but you, could, uh, you might as well implement it on top of Flink as well. It will dynamically create new database tables uh, in your database of choice. Uh, it's actually a database of our choice because we don't expose this thing to the users. They will query it through, the re through a REST API so they can get the aggregates for a specific aggregator uh, between these two timestamps, or they can do some filtering on top of that. And also, we have some nice tooling around, in the, around it so you can create the dashboards very easily. All right. Uh, I added this slide, slide today because I heard that testing your production uh, applications is actually a good practice. Uh, so we have put together some uh, testing functionality uh, where we can integration test this whole RBA platform. Uh, so the basic abstraction is the RBA test pipeline, where in a timely manner you can send all the different actions that would happen to uh, uh, this platform in the actual uh, running environment. So for instance, you will start an RBA test pipeline, an RBA test job, and you will start by deploying some uh, test processor one, which is a user script. Processor is like the, is the backend terminology for, for a user script. Then you also deploy another processor called test processor two, they will have different IDs, uh, it doesn't matter. And then you, will run, then you will send some event. This event will be executed for the already deployed processors. And then you maybe remove a processor. These are actions that you, users will otherwise take clicking through the web UI uh, that we provide them. Then you can increment the watermark. So this way you can test the timer functionality and the window aggregates. You can also, after the watermark, trigger a failure of the pipeline, which will, which will be a one-time failure. So we can test the stateful recovery logic on the backend side, then send some more events, and yeah, whatever, finish with something. Uh, then you can run this pipeline, get the outputs, and do some nice verifications on it. Uh, we have some, a lot of tooling around this. In addition to this, we also, of course, have some unit testing for different components. We use the, the Flink testing tools, the test harnesses that are uh, developed by the Flink community to make some nice tests for the different operators. All right. So now we've built our, uh, our platform. So it's time to run it, I guess. So how do we do it? Well, we, we again went through um, some steps and different uh, approaches over the time. Of course, like everyone else, I guess, we started off with a standalone Flink cluster of six uh, smaller machines. And for the checkpoint storage layer, we used a file system called Ceph. Uh, most of you probably don't know it. It's something like HDFS, but it's, yeah, it's called something different. Uh, yeah, so once our uh, applications uh, grow, grew beyond our capacity. We got some shiny new servers, which were actually uh, much beefier ones with a lot of RAM and two terabyte SSDs. So the RocksDB will actually perform nicely. Uh, we got 12 of them, but we still kept the, the Ceph file system because this is what we got from operations. So I guess that was fine. Uh, but then we started running into a lot of uh, stupid problems with Ceph. It kind of started hanging our machines because it wasn't really made for this sort of burst loads that our checkpoint generated as the state sizes uh, grew larger. So at one point, uh, we just completely ditched Ceph and uh, uh, we went all over on uh, the Hadoop stack. So then we also got uh, uh, another 24 new machines. So currently we're running 36 of these uh, machines on our own Hadoop cluster, and the checkpoints are stored on HDFS. Uh, the Hadoop cluster is running on the same uh, physical nodes as the Flink jobs, so this way we get better, very, very nice uh, checkpointing performance, uh, and we're pretty happy with it. We're getting a bunch of new servers as uh, more and more scripts are deployed, but uh, that's, I guess, 
something for the future. All right. So the next big topic that we've already heard a couple of times today is application management in Flink. You have a bunch of these Flink jobs, and yeah, you, you want to deploy uh, bug, fixes, bug fixes to it. You want to create save points, manage the save points. So, uh, so something similar to what the data artisans uh, guys are building with into their DA platform, we built our own in-house uh, version of a Flink application manager. Uh, what this really means, it's a bunch of Python scripts on top of the Flink provided functionality without a GUI. So I guess it's uh, vastly inferior to, uh, to the other approach. But it kind of works for us for the simple cases. We have some application management based on application IDs. We can look, up, look them up on Yarn, uh, execute some actions that you would get from, from Flink. We have some save point management, so you can restore a job from a specific save point, uh, search them in time. Also, some application versioning and automatic fallback to stable versions if a deployment fails for some reason. So maybe uh, even though we run all our tests, it still produces some bugs, uh, weird. Uh, then it would fall back to the stable version and hopefully will not fail again. We had some limited integration to continuous deployment through Jenkins. So you, yeah, you push to Git, and then yeah, you get a deployment. We kind of turned that feature off because it's not a very good experience that uh, you push something to Git and it's immediately deployed. Uh, with the current recovery costs, it's actually something that you need to keep in mind when you want to do. And all of these run across several different cluster environments. So we have, of course, a production environment. QA environment, and yeah, one could start a new Yarn cluster and set up the configuration files. So it points there, and it should just work. All right. So another important topic, I guess, for, for production jobs is metrics and monitoring. Uh, we've built uh, a bunch of shiny dashboards around uh, the fling metrics and some alerts if something goes wrong, if we, the lag is increasing in Kafka, or the processing time uh, starts increasing. So maybe somebody deployed a, a script that has an infinite loop in it. Uh, that's pretty hard to catch in the current architecture. So we have metrics everywhere. Basically, uh, on top of the, the regular fling metrics, uh, we we added our custom gauges and different types of metrics to measure all the different API interactions that users do uh, through our APIs. So we have a fairly good uh, picture of what's going on inside the job. Uh, most of the metrics, uh, for, the most, for the, most of the metrics, we use uh, exponential moving averages to smooth, smooth it out over time to get some sort of a estimate for a windowed uh, measurement. Uh, and furthermore, for some of them, we even, even used the, fl uh, the Flink windowing mechanism to aggregate them uh, in a nice way. And of course, if something goes wrong, we, we like to do CPU profiling because it is actually a very nice thing to do. So if you haven't tried to CPU profile your Flink application, I encourage everyone to do, to do so. It's, a, it's, it's actually a pretty good learning experience. All right. So let's, last thing I would like to talk about is actually not something that we've built. It's just something that we're very excited about. And I would maybe like to share this excitement uh, with you guys. Uh, it's, a, it's a research project from Microsoft. It's called Dalion. Uh, they published a paper about it in, in v at VLDB this year. So you can all Google it and, and read it. Uh, what, this, what this project is about is it's about self-regulating streaming systems. So basically, if you have a, a set of different metrics, how do you figure out what's the problem with your streaming pipeline, and what are you going to do about it? So this problem is pretty hard in general. I mean, if, you, if you've tried debugging like, performance problems in your application, you will, you will probably no, learn that there are different aspects uh, to a framework like Flink, and a lot of things can go wrong in a lot of different places. So Dalion provides a nice framework for defining different uh, policies to, to detect these problems. So the way it works is that, first of all, 
you have a symptom detection step where you define a set of symptom detectors. For instance, uh, there is a, a large uh, queue in the, in the data transfer buffers, uh, or there is a back pressure, or there is a processing queue, or the processing rate is slow. And based on the symptom, detections, uh, symptom detectors, you will try to set up some diagnosis on what the problem might, might be. So you can nicely formulate uh, the diagnosis uh, for different problems. So for instance, you can add a diagnoser that will try to figure out whether the problem is uh, under provisioning. You don't have enough compute resources. And that's kind of an easy thing to solve. But uh, maybe you have data skew. That's going to be trickier or one of your instances in the cluster is just slow. And the idea is that based on uh, the different symptoms, you should, be, you should be able to clearly distinguish these different uh, problems uh, in, your, in your cluster. And once you have a proper diagnosis, then you can take some action on it. If you don't have enough uh, resources, you can scale your job up or maybe change your partitioning function if you have data skew uh, or restart or kill an instance if it was slow. So Dalian is about uh, making all this logic that I just uh, said uh, into a very nice framework with nice abstractions. Uh, it is implemented on, on Heron, uh, but I would say the, mat the metrics and the different diagnostic logic maps pretty much directly to Apache Flink. So I think it's a, uh, it's a nice it would be a nice effort to, to make this happen, uh, because I think this would help a lot of people. N maybe not the re resolution part where you take automatic actions to like, fix all your uh, weird problems, but I think the diagno diagnostic part would be the most help for, for most of the application, or most of the production users of these systems. All right, so just, to, just as a closing uh, slide, I would like to say that uh, King is hiring. We're looking for developers in our uh, streaming team. So if you would like to work on our cool systems, talk to us or send us an email if you're shy or your employer is here. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. So I think we have time for a few questions, if any. <laughs> Save me. How do you test user scripts to make sure that they, they don't break the whole cluster? Uh, well, you have to run them, right, somewhere. So we have, we have testing environments where... Uh, so basically, uh, the main approach that we're trying to take is that uh, we, s we have a bunch of different environments uh, where you can run your script. And uh, you can think, uh, think about it in a way that like a, a team could get their own environment. So if they want to experiment with some uh, new script ideas, we could set up a new environment where they could uh, test it. Uh, so it's kind of on a, on a trust basis. So we don't uh, force them to test it. They are kind of free to deploy it in the production environment, but this, this never happens uh, in reality. Uh, yeah, so basically the answer is, Deploy it in the testing environment. If it works, then deploy it in the production environment. There's all, there are also some testing tools where we can run your script on, on a sample of the Kafka stream in a dummy script runner that catches some issues. Obviously, will not. Uh, if you if you want to break it, you you can. Yeah. Yes. Hey, did I get it right that your data is keyed, but it's keyed only on one key type, right? Is it like, uh, I don't know, uh, a player ID? Yeah. What if someone wants to have analysis uh, which is across players? Mm -hmm. Is it also possible? Uh, because you said it's in one job, so you yeah. have only one key, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on what you want to do. I mean, if you want to aggregate things, then the key doesn't really matter because aggregations are kind of global anyways. But if you want to, so we don't aggregate. When you create an aggregator, for instance, for every game start, you increment uh, a counter. Those are actually proper aggregates across all players. So that is not aggregator functionality is not tied to a specific user. So aggregations are usually what you do across players. 
but but let, maybe let's reformulate the question so that I can answer it in a different way as well. If you want to keep state on a different, because only stateful functionality is the one that requires a key or timers. If you want to have stateful functionality on a different key, uh, then you can't you you cannot do it in the same environment because I mean there is a single operator that has to be partitioned in some way. Uh, but we can, of course, start a new a new backend that will have a different partitioning scheme for your application. It's not a huge overhead. I mean, you're still uh, just going to consume the events like one more time. It's just a new Flink application. Yes. All right. Yeah. One more question. Uh, another question is: uh, Are you? Uh, do you keep a state from the beginning of, I don't know, some beginning of your uh, <laughs> King platform or whatever? Uh, because you said that you're keeping aggregates um, like, I don't know, a, a player level, yeah, yeah. say, a uh, player skill level. Yeah, so there's no time to live uh, setting for the states, so they're accumulated over time. We'll probably add some options for, for, so, pe for, so people can declare that they're not really interested in the state after so many time, so many like days. You can implement this uh, logic with timers, but if you just use the state as the default functionality, we keep them forever, like you would, uh, like you would expect from a fling like value state. Yeah. It doesn't really hurt to accumulate state. They're in RocksDB. The incremental checkpoints are pretty much constant in size, no matter the, the state size. Well, recovery uh, gets problematic, but yeah, that's a different. All right. So, well, thank you very much. Thank you.